Social Science this year reported that the giant earthquake, the one that caused the Asian tsunami and that ruptured more than 800 miles of seafloor in the Indian Ocean, also set off a series of temblors nearly nine, set, felt nearly 7,000 miles away. In Alaska, one hour after the quake, Mount Wrangell recorded 14 small earthquakes in 11 minutes. Said Dr. Michael E. West of the Alaska Volcano Observatory, it was pulsing, if you will, in sync with the waves from Sumatra. In fact, the earthquake's massive shock waves moved around the world, raising and depositing the Earth's crust by half an inch. The Earth vibrated like a bell for weeks after. Commented Dr. West, we're learning that the Earth is a far more connected place than we thought. <laughs> <laughs> what if it's all connected? <laughs> that question arose in the 1960s for scientific researcher James Lovelock. After NASA asked him to design experiments for the Viking space mission to determine if there were ever life on Mars, he began to ponder what makes life different from non-life. Outer space brought him back down to Earth. Lovelock was intrigued that the Earth's atmosphere has remained relatively constant over long periods of time. Just a small increase or decrease in the amount of oxygen would either set the atmosphere on fire or kill most life forms. Why has the ratio of oxygen remained at just the right level? Why have the oceans maintained just the right salt concentration that's favorable to life? How has the temperature range that life needs and depends on managed to remain relatively constant. Lovelock's bold hypothesis was that somehow the sum total of living things on Earth has modulated the balance of oxygen and carbon dioxide, the saltiness of the sea, and the surface temperature of the planet, just as our bodies know how to regulate themselves. He proposed the Gaia hypothesis, the idea that the entire sum of all living things self-regulates the Earth's conditions to make the physical environment more hospitable for them in an exquisite dynamic balance. Think of it as a vast hospitality enterprise. Or, in the immortal words of Janine Benyus, what life does is create conditions conducive to life. Of course, for millennia, indigenous peoples, the world's original pioneers, have held exactly this Gaian view. It's all alive, it's all connected, it's all intelligent, it's all relatives. At this critical moment, when for the first time in history, humanity has the capacity to destroy the conditions conducive to life on a global scale, Janine Benyus directs our attention to nature's own solutions. These are the time-tested processes that have made life flourish during 3.8 billion years of evolution. Janine even gave this field a name, biomimicry, in, in, um, innovation inspired by nature, the title of her groundbreaking 1997 book. For all the chatter about the age of information, what we're really entering is the age of biology, and Janine is one of our greatest guides. After all, we didn't invent nature, nature invented us. Nature bats last, as the saying goes, but even more importantly, it's her playing field. Janine suggests we would be wise to learn the ground rules and how to play by them. As she has shown over and over again, the solutions residing in nature surpass our conception of what's even possible. The very genius of nature that we're destroying is precisely what we now need to get us out of this pickle. When Janine first began to explore biomimicry, she interviewed biologists, engineers, designers, and inventors who study nature's operating instructions. She embarked on a quest to learn how to design appropriately for human civilization by modeling it on the living systems that can show us practical ways to serve human ends harmlessly. Janine is an educator and life sciences writer who has degrees in forestry, natural resource management, and English literature. She's written three field guides, including a sly animal field guide called Beastly Behaviors. She's been a backpacking expedition leader, and she's active in protecting the wildlands of her own home turf in Montana. In collaboration with the Rocky Mountain Institute, she's developing an interactive database called Nature's Solutions. Its purpose is to collect biomimetic approaches and disseminate them into the public domain, because after all, nature does not come with barcodes. <laughs> 
She's also creating a functional design course for all educational levels. In 1998, Janine co-founded the Biomimicry Guild. Her favorite role these days is as a biologist at the design table, helping innovators consult life's genius in well-adapted products and processes. So please join me for a rousing close encounter of the biological kind with our beloved biomimic, Janine Benyus. Pioneers. Woo! Oh, yeah. Oh, I am the first penguin off the iceberg again. Penny, Nina, and uh, the water is fine. I'm here to tell you it's bubbling with love as always. Uh, it's good to be back. Um, this is, if this is your first time, this is a Kind of a seasonal ceremony, this pioneers. You know, if, if we were migrating birds, this is our staging ground, you know, where we come and we, we talk about what we hatched this year and what breeding was like. And uh, so we talk about in the hallways. And we talk about our dream of where we're going to go to better climbs. Um, and we murmur our stories to one another about the way to go there, how to get there. And I wish for you, for this conference, and for everybody in satellite land, hello, Bozeman, um, I hope that you find a flying partner at this conference. I hope you find a flying flock and gaggle uh, it's much easier as a group. Um, and I hope that you find a guide who knows the way home, a guide who knows the way and the ways of this earth. That's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, Kenny was right. This ringing earth, the earth is ringing. The earth is ringing off the hook. And I feel like we're in a dream and we're moving through molasses to go answer it. You know? Does it feel like that? Yes. Ugh. <laughs> and we've, we're heading for this evolutionary knothole. Let's not kid ourselves. We are. And if we are to get through that knothole, splinters and all, that's the pain that you're feeling. <laughs> And if we are to bloom on the other side as a keystone species, you know, not an ecological dominant, a keystone, a, a species that by their presence, by the way they live their lives, makes it possible for other species to live their lives. Um, if we're to bloom and become this keystone species, I really think the first thing we have to do is quiet human cleverness. <laughs> Um, life survives through an accurate reading of its context. Um, and it takes a deep, deep listening. Um, and with apologies to Dr. Lakoff, it takes at times um, thinking like an elephant, um, at least listening like one. Um, <laughs> 50 miles north of Phuket, hours before the tsunami, these guys started trumpeting. Lizards, insects, snakes started climbing up into trees. The flamingos that were breeding near there had already gone in. In Yala National Park, they were shocked, shocked to not find any animal corpses besides humans. They had moved in. They had moved up. Pacinian corpuscles, OK? That's what I love about science. We get to use these wonderful words. In the tip of 
this elephant's trunk, in its feet, and in your joints are these mechanoreceptors, these, these senses in which you can feel what's called Raleigh waves, these waves that move, that, that were started by the, the rupture in the earth. These Raleigh waves move in the surface of the earth about 10 times faster than the speed of sound. And infrasound, they pick up infrasound. They talk to one another with infrasound, very low tones through the air. Their infrasound, we now think, causes Raleigh waves in the earth so that their messages can go even farther, so that an elephant can say, I'm ovulating, come home. <laughs> um, it doesn't happen often. <laughs> um, an hour before, they started to wail. And before the first waves hit, these elephants who were toting tourists around broke their chains and ran inland. We, of course, ran towards the sea. <laughs> we are a young species <laughs> with a lot to learn. We see through a glass darkly, and when you do, you should probably borrow some lenses from the organisms that can see much better. I'm tuned these days into survivors. This is the Seven Sisters Oak on Lake Pontchartrain. This live oak is 1,200 years old. And she made it. Um, and so did, uh, there are about 740 live oaks on St. Charles Street. Only four of them died. Um, these live oaks know how to live on the Gulf Coast. They really, really do. And if we are to build, and you know, uh, an oceanfront property is going to be a lot farther inland in a few years, um, are the architects who are meeting in charrettes these days to decide about how to rebuild, are they outside talking to the Seven Sisters Oak? Because if they were, they'd find out all kinds of things about surviving high winds. Um, this is an organism that will grow not tall, not skyscraper size, maybe 60 to 80 feet tall, but it'll grow 60 feet wide. Its roots beneath the ground, 150 feet wide, okay? And its, its trunk spirals. You see that those shapes are in response to wind. As the wind blows, the tree actually begins to grow in that gnarled way. And the top of the tree, you can see here, the wind actually goes over these live oaks. In fact, if you have a live oak near your house, it will help the wind go over your house as well. You may find a few branches flowing because what happens is as the wind blows, these trees do what's called reformation. They sort of bend this way with the wind. Their leaves actually curl into cylinders to let the wind go through. They yield as we buttress with more, more concrete, more concrete. <laughs> they yield, and they let go of some of their leaves, yes, and they let go of some of their branches, and they call it a cleansing. What you don't see is those roots under the ground. They are connected to other roots. They're grafted together with other roots. So it's not one live oak holding itself. You know, as it, uh, the administration wants us to believe, it's a go it alone society. Not here. Having your roots connected to other trees is very useful when a very large wind comes. Architects take note. So biomimicry is learning from the locals, and there is much to learn. There is not one solution uh, that fits all. There is just a really smart way to find solutions, and biomimicry is one of those ways. I'm going to, be, because this is such a haiku, I'm going to move quickly through a few examples that might be new since I was here a couple of years ago to some of you. We're going to have a, a chemistry panel later on today with, with uh, Terry Collins and Paul Anastas, two really, really hot chemists. Got to be there. Um, anyway, life-friendly chemistry is extremely important 
Um, this is an interesting one. It, it, there's 100 carcinogens in the water outside of Silicon Valley. The high-tech industries, this, especially the making of chips, is incredibly toxic. Interestingly, this is a diatom. It's made of silica. It's glass. It's a skeleton of a very, very small um, microorganism of, of the billions in the ocean. These glassy structures are made in seawater without toxin, without high pressures, of course, no carcinogens. And finally, um, at University of California, Santa Barbara, we're finally learning to mimic the way these glasses are formed. That could revolutionize the way our computer chips, and it should revolutionize the way our computer chips are made. Um, and if you're wondering about doing intricate shapes, this is from Haeckel. These are the Radelarians, uh relative species. Glass, silicon. Um, we're not the first to work with silicon in this way. Um, here's another exciting one. Uh, buildings, plywood, uh, particle board. If you're going to use, if, you, if you're going to move away from using old growth timber and you want to use, use parts of wood and put them together into strong shapes, unfortunately, here's the dirty little secret there. The glue that we use, it's got formaldehyde in it, urea formaldehyde. Um, and it's, it's very toxic. This is a blue mussel who glues itself underwater, okay? It's glue cures underwater. Um, we've been trying for 35 years to mimic that recipe, not to harvest this critter and use its glue, but to literally take a page out of its recipe book. And finally, at Oregon State University, um, a scientist figured out how to mimic it and how to mimic it really, really inexpensively. And it's being tested right now as an alternative to that glue. And uh, it's Columbia Forest Products who's doing it. And I'm watching. That's going to be a very, very big one in terms of getting some of the toxicity out of the buildings that we live in, the shelters we live in. Life shops at home. No doubt. Um, there is an abundance of raw materials that we don't see. Again, we have to borrow their lenses to see it. Um, this is a fun one, uh, an exciting one. I come from Montana, a hard rock mining state, and we talk about the Earth's tears, the bitter ones that we still live with 50 years later in our Clark Fork rivers and other rivers. Um, hard rock mining is to get metals, in part. Um, there are more than enough metal particles on top of the Earth right now, OK? More than enough to mine our landfills, to mine our waters that are full of heavy metals. Um, how do we do that? These are bacteria, microbes, have amazing molecules to be able to pull metals out of water, scavenge them out of water, and mimicking those. Again, not using those. It's not about harvesting, grinding up, domesticating, putting a new farm fence around these guys. Literally, asking them how they do it. There's a company called MR3 here in, here in San Francisco that's making filters that you can put in water. And they're coated with a mimic that we've learned from these microbes. So there's a filter for mercury, and a filter for iron, and a filter for different kinds of metals. And you can pull that filter out and recover large amounts of metal. It's a new kind of mining. Um, this is my favorite one. Um, this is this baby face scientist rocked my world ma many years ago um, when he, and, and many of us, um, when he found a way to use CO2 as a feedstock for plastics. Now think about that. What plants do is they take CO2 and they use that carbon to make wood, to make sugars and starches, polymers. He said, why don't we use CO2 to make plastics, biodegradable plastics? We've got a lot of it. <laughs> Only this species, right, would think of it as a poison. Much, m many other species would say, yum. <laughs> CO2, lots of it. Um, he's found a catalyst. 
He's making polycarbonates. He's making biodegradable plastics out of CO2. Um, that's a big deal. Um, and, he, and he started a new company, small company called Novamer. Um, it's not fast enough yet, but we, we get what we pay for in terms of research, you know? We should, be res we should be supporting things like this, I think. Here's another one. If we want to have fuel cells, the hydrogen economy, the thing that makes them so expensive is that there's a membrane in there that does the hydrogen chemistry and it's coated with platinum. Very expensive, back to mining. Blue-greens do hydrogen chemistry all the time. Looking at those blue-greens, mimicking the molecule, it's called a hydrogenase enzyme, mimicking that and coating that on a membrane has a possibility of making fuel cells very inexpensive. Extremely important work there, too, at John Innes Center in the UK. This is another one. If we want hydrogen, we're, now we're looking at getting it out of fuel cells. I mean, excuse me, getting it out of fossil fuels. Water is an abundant raw material. Getting it out of water, that's what plants do. They split water to get oxygen that we breathe and to get these hydrogen ions as well. There's a molecule in every green frond and blade and cell around us that knows how to do this. Um, we're finally, again, it takes a deep, deep conversation to understand how these organisms have done that and then to try to mimic it or emulate it in our own crude ways. Um, this is very important work. Life serves for free. There is no doubt about it. Um, there's an energy policy for you, <laughs> okay? Um, <laughs> I have flying squirrels in my cabin in the roof. They're a tremendous amount of sun. Um, shape. Life uses shape. Here's a great one. Humpback whale. See the bumps on the fins there? Looks random? Not at all. Tubercles. A guy named Frank Fish, no pun intended. Um, nominal determinism in this field, uh, they're mammals. Um, but anyway, uh, said to himself, you know, those bumps are probably helping that organism uh, reduce drag in the water. It's been millions of years of evolution, okay? He took a model of an airplane wing, flow is flow without bumps, our airplane wing, and put bumps on the airplane wing, 32% fuel savings. <laughs> this isn't an industry where one to 2% is like, oh my, you know, percussive. 32%, 6% better lift. Just in case you wanna jump out of the water to express yourself. Um, Here's another one. Um, the bullet train in Japan, mass transit. It was shaped like a bullet. When it went through a tunnel, it caused a pressure wave in front of it, and as it exited the tunnel, it made a sonic boom. People live like around the tunnel entrances and exits in Japan, so it wasn't going over well. The boss told this engineer, make a quieter bullet train. He happened to be a master birder. He went that night to the equivalent of an Audubon Society meeting and he started to think. What goes from one density of medium to another density of medium? And he thought about the kingfisher that, that dives from air into water. Okay, that's one density to another. And he thought about that beak. Now again, millions of years in the making, but it's a small beak, and that's a big train. You know, can it, does it scale? He tried it. It cut down on the noise dramatically, and it saved 15% in electricity costs for the train.
everybody is getting in the act these days. Um, this is actually a, uh, a diesel car. It's a concept car from um, Daimler Chrysler. And it's getting 70 miles an hour, um, 70 miles per gallon, excuse me, um, which is pretty good for diesel. And they think it could even get more. What they did was they said, OK, I know that that box fish there does not look aerodynamic, and they didn't think it did either, but it, it's in a coral reef, and there's waters coming past it all the time, and it has to keep its position, okay? And so it has a certain kind of aerodynamic grace. Plus, it was boxy enough that, you know, it, it looked like our transports. Um, but the engineers kept saying, no, 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 the ideal aerodynamic shape is the teardrop. And we know this, case closed. But this engineer kept saying, no, you know, let's try this box fish. They did a model, and it came within a very small fraction of the ideal um, aerodynamic shape, this box fish, believe it or not. And then they went further, and they said, OK, well, let's look at it. It's, it's got these bony plates, and it's got this incredible structure skeletal structure, and so they made the plates of the car like this, and they reduced its weight, the, car, the weight of the car, 40%. Um, yeah, so um, they're believers. Now I just wish we could have, like, snake transport so we could do away with roads completely, and we could just go up and around our buildings and up and around trees instead. We're going, like, through molasses, remember. Um, The biggest thing that we need to do, it's not product by product by product, and that's not going to get us um, this on a systems level. Um, this is a picture of our mapping of some of the organisms in a coral reef. This is the new food webs kind of uh, software that's so amazing. It's a Caribbean coral reef. Look at how densely interconnected that is. Can you imagine a piece of nutritious food falling through that web? No. And being lost? So getting, getting our society into a closed loop place in which we don't need to dig under the ground for any more metals because we know where they all are and we're trading them. And it's a, it's a take back economy. Products are coming back, materials are coming back, and we start to close those loops as well as a coral reef does. We have lots and lots to learn. One of the things that is so important right now is not just that we get the materials like metals back, the inorganic materials. As we move to a bio-based economy, in which we are using more and more bioplastics kinds of things, things that come from corn starch, things that come of the earth, from the earth, that the corn plant does our work for us, and then we use those starches. I have a fear that the new oil head, the new well head, is soil fertility. We do want to go to a carbohydrate economy, but what we need to do right now is form an infrastructure, a give-back economy, that gets that organic material back to the soil. Really important. Let's start working on that. Let's start working on that. All right. Um, there is still so much to learn. Um, and I really do think that it starts with agriculture. Um, that's a picture of the sediment coming down out of the Mississippi. Um, we've lost a third of our topsoil in the last 100 years. We've got to get agriculture right. Perennial polyculture is a good way to start the Land Institute's work. Um, there's an enormous amount to learn. So you have all these people in biology and ecology studying these organisms. You have all these designers and engineers who now say, OK, we want to create more gracefully and for the long haul here on Earth, better adapted. But we don't know anything about biology. Let me tell you about it. Let me, let me tell you what, what we've been hatching uh, over the last couple of years. 
It seems to me that biomimicry can be used for a lot of things, weaponry, you know the drill, robotics. I don't talk about that kind of stuff because I think that there's a lot of things that we need to solve. We need to come up with some grand challenges and sustainability. And then we need to go and have deep conversations with these organisms and ask them the way home. Um, one of the things that we're working on is this website Kenny alluded to which I would love dearly for you guys to contribute to. And what this is is a place where biologists, but where, where designers and engineers can put up challenges, sustainability challenges, a problem they need to solve. Biologists, if they know an organism who knows how to do this already, put, puts up information about that organism, the papers. So what we do is we filter feed through the biological literature and put up there what we need in a design context so that it's prior art, it's on the web, and it cannot be patented, but it's available for everyone free. <laughs> to be able to learn from. That's our common heritage. It's our commons. Um, anyway, that's one of, one of the ways that, one of the things we're working on. Um, this is another one which is really, really dear to my heart, and I, and I appreciate being at Bioneers to be able to announce this. If the path of biomimicry is quieting human cleverness, and then listening deeply, and then echoing what we hear, that's only half the way home. The last step is a thanksgiving step. It's a it's a giving thanks to these organisms. So what I would like to have your help in instituting is a program by which the companies, the organizations, the individuals who are learning from the natural world devote, donate a percentage of the royalties from every single product and process to preserving the habitat of the organism that inspired the innovation. And in the hallways, after you tell me how breeding season was, please talk to me about how we can work on this. I wish you a wonderful staging ground. Enjoy yourselves, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.